Ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely glad to welcome you uh, on behalf of the Vodafone Foundation to this conference today. And I'm, I'm fully aware of the fact that starting with a welcoming address by the financial sponsor is also a nudge. It Actually, it's at least part of a choice architecture that might nudge you into checking your emails before um, Christian Möller starts the really substantial welcoming remarks. Um, and if you consider that, it might be a choice for the better of you if judged by yourself. And since I'm fully aware of that, I promise to be brief, which of course is also a nudge. I'm, I'm actually also advised to be rather brief because our involvement in all this stems from a kind of inferiority complex because obviously the company behind our foundation is rather big and displays a significant uh, financial um, strength which is not completely true for our foundation. So compared to other big German foundations, we are a rather small fish in the pond. Uh, so we aren't able to roll out nationwide programs and um, achieve um, impact with those kind of very expensive programs. So in a way, we are forced to look for ways to spend the limited resources we have in a more effective and smarter way. And it was exactly this kind of perspective that led us to the concept and idea of nudging. And when we read the book Nudge by Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler, we felt that it would provide an extremely interesting perspective also for the work of foundations. Now, we don't regard ourselves as a kind of source or hub of supreme intelligence and learning. Um, so what we did is we invited people who are representatives of this world of supreme intelligence and learning to help us designing um, uh, programs, shaping our ideas on this. And at least two of those people are among us, Cass Sunstein and uh, Christoph Engel, um, Armin Falk, uh, representatives of the Behavioral Insights Unit of Downing Street also uh, joined us. And the result was a policy paper that was widely spread and met with, with from our perspective, tremendous response. Uh, that was quite surprising. Um, but when we discussed this paper, we were always confronted with one question, and that was, isn't it unethical to, in a way, exploit human weakness, for instance, inertia, to achieve political results? We always thought that the concept would rather contain the contrary, because our key subject for the foundation is social mobility. And we always thought applying the concept of nudging might provide information in a way that even gives people with a less sophisticated educational background the chance and opportunity to take decisions and see the consequences of decisions, which they wouldn't do if the information, which is part of the choice architecture, would have been presented in a much more complex way. So we thought rather that nudging could enable autonomous decision, but as I said, we always were confronted with the question whether it also might lead to a kind of unethical um, instrument. And because we were always confronted with that, we thought it might be worth really exploring this. So when um, Alexandra Kemmerer and Max Steinbeis and Christoph Mellers came to us and, and we discussed the concept, we thought it would really be worthwhile to put this at the center of a conference like this and really invite, um, well, some of the most brilliant legal scholars to explore the ethics of nudging or the legitimacy of nudging in a much more deeper way. And that's why we uh, came here today and I'm extremely grateful that it was possible because obviously, as I said, we. We are mere the financial sponsors, but the work was, of course, done by others. And as those of you know who have already on organized the conference, the bulk of the work is done before. So I think it's absolutely justified um, to do some credit to those who have organized this at the beginning of the conference and not just at the end. So I'm, I'm really pleased to thank Alexandra Kemmerer, Max Steinbeis, Christoph Möllers, Gerhard Wagner, Susanne Ulher. Anne Benaric, Christopher Unseld, and um, Johanna Börstupan and Sebastian Gallander from our team for making this possible. 
And with that, I gladly hand over to Christopher Mullers, who now will start with the substantial welcome remarks. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, again, not so much, too, so much substance from me, actually, this morning. Um, again, I have start to, to welcome you in, in a double function. First of all, it's my great pleasure to welcome you today um, and send my regards from the president of the Humboldt University, who cannot be with us today, but who is, in a way, aware of this conference, or is one of the sponsors of the conference, because the Verfassungsblock, um, which is, in a way, the main um, basis from, from, the, from the academic side of the conference is sponsored by the Humboldt University, by the excellence um, um, funding of the Humboldt University. And it's interesting that this, our idea of reorganizing the idea of blogging in something that is perhaps different from, from, diff, from other blogs, something in between an academic review on the one hand and an, you know, uh, something like a less personal and more scientific form of um, 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 research communication is now somehow accepted even by um, the standards of German research funding as a research project, and we're very glad and thankful for that. I've always also to thank you on behalf of the conveners, so I'm in a way one of the conveners, but I have to thank some of the conveners, which have much more contributed to this conference than I have. Again, I have to mention two names Mark has already mentioned, but I want to underline that Alexandra Kemra is in a way not only an organizer of this conference, but is truly a brain and someone who has um, done much of the conceptual work that made um, the participation of so many interesting scholars possible. And Max Steinmeiss again, who is not only one member of the Verfassungsblock, but who is the Verfassungsblock, I'll say that. Um, the rest is the organization of the Verfassungsblock, but if you want to give an ontology of the Verfassungsblock, you know you have to look at Max. So this other people have to be thanked for, Susanne Uhler, I want to mention, Anne Bednaric, André von Horn, Christopher Unselt, um, who have worked very, very hard um, in the beginning, uh, in the last days, and I am a testimony to that to make all of this possible. Now it says introduction on the program, and I think this is not appropriate, um, given the quality of the panels and the fact that we try to have a format here in which everybody is prepared, everybody has sent in papers, everybody has thought hard about the issues so that um, it would be strange to give you an introduction to about something that you know better than I do, probably. Let me just make some rather defensive, very short methodological caveats on what we should talk about, and this will only take two minutes or one and a half, not more. So, four caveats. We have always what we should always somehow bear in mind. We should bear in mind what we are talking about, obviously. The image of Natchez somehow invites us to a somewhat ubiquitous understanding, and I think Kersanstein yesterday explained to us that nudging is an inevitable, and I think that is convincing, but it also seems to be ubiquitous, and the ubiquity, ubiquity of nudging seems to be a problem when conceptualizing what we are talking about. There is a danger in that we talk about everything when we say that nudging is inevitable and ubiquitous, and we have to reflect upon that when we debate the issues. Second caveat, on which level are we talking? We are stopped talking about regulatory choices. We are now in another phase. We are now, somehow seem to talk not about options, but about duties or obligations. This is at least the essence of an ethics of nudging. And, and we have to reflect upon if we want to enter into this kind of phase, if we want perhaps remain treating um, nudging as an option or really want to get into um, in discourse that oblige, obliges us to, um, to this form of um, um, instrumental regulation. And then we have to reflect upon which kind of duty it is we're talking about. Is it a political duty, a moral duty, or whatever? Third caveat, perhaps we should think about a little bit more about the wider regulatory context. Do models from the United States work in the continental European welfare state system? Maybe they do, but by maybe they are specific for a system, if I may say so, my American friends won't, uh, won't complain, I hope, specific for a system with a very weak welfare tradition and with a pretty broken democratic process. So maybe consensus has to be built for systems that don't find other means to make political decisions. Maybe, maybe not. 
And finally, and we have talked about that yesterday too, but I think it's still on the, on the um, plate, is are there trade-offs? So what do we actually lose when we, certain, when we choose this certain, uh, when we make certain regulatory choices? What is in a way left over? What is forgotten? What is in a way treated worse by a deliberate choice for regulatory means that somehow are you making use of means of, of nudging? Four caveats. What kind of, what are we talking about? What kind of obligations, do we talk about obligations? What kind of obligation is it? What kind of context do we talk about? Can we really just jump from the abstract um, to the example? Or is there something like an intermediate level we have to think about? And finally, what are the trade-offs? I think these are questions we should somehow keep in mind when we um, lead our discussions. And final, trivial but important word for us, you have a questionnaire in your, in your um, materials. Please fill it in. This is part of the, our, um, our move to get some information about the readers of the Verfassungsblock, which is kind of crucial for us, actually, because we're doing some, we need this information, and we're doing actually some real research about the questions, what kind of um, research um, or communication instruments are perhaps appropriate in the 21st century. We even have an ethnologist and anthropologist um, studying us as, you know, as an object, and therefore please um, make use of the questionnaire, that would be extremely helpful. That's it from my side. Thank you everybody for coming, it's always a little miracle, you know. You're thinking about people, you're, you're trading names, you're thinking this guy should come, or she, she, she should come, and then you plan, and at the end they are here. You know, this is something that is somehow unbelievable for the organizers, and we're very grateful that this miracle came true. Thank you very much.